then I, then I will uh, give a description about what is the SAR interferometry, how the techniques work, how the measurements of the distance between uh, satellite and air surface uh, calculated using SAR interferometry by describing the NSAR geometry and the types of the interferometry. And the special type that we use called the differential interferometry. Then I will give a brief land subsidence case uh, that I studied during my PhD within the United Arab Emirates. Uh, as we all know that the microwave remote sensing is a satellite-based technology that depends on uh, taking picture or image for the land surface from space through sa satellites that orbiting around the Earth globe. Uh, microwave remote sensing is uh, uh, the part that we are interested in is the active remote sensing. There is a passive microwave remote sensing, but this technique or this technology is relies on relying on the active remote sensing. And we know the main difference between the active and passive, that the passive remote sensing, it depends on other illuminating source. Uh, in most cases, it is the sun, while active remote sensing depends on transmitting their own uh, signal or using their own illuminating source. Uh, the wavelengths that cover in microwave remote sensing, it is uh, wider than optical remote sensing. Uh, it covers the range from one millimeter to one meter. And this part of the spectrum, yeah, it has so many characteristics different from the optical range of spectrum. Because uh, it is independent of weather that can be operated uh, during clouds or dust or any weather except for heavy rainfall, so that the uh, uh, microwave or radar remote sensing will uh, will not observe the air surface in very good manner for remote sensing application during uh, heavy rainfall. Uh, also. Longer wavelengths can penetrate vegetation and dry soil for some extent. In some cases that the penetration of the microwave remote sensing for longer wavelengths, like in uh, more than 20 or 50 centimeters, it can penetrate dry soils. But for a small uh, distance, like a small depth for two or three meters. Like uh, I said in the previous slide that it is uh, active, so it depends on transmitting it is on microwave energy, then receiving the back scattered energy from the target. So the journey uh, contains two paths, the transmitting and receiving path. The well uh, used or the most known, most used uh, wavelengths in uh, microwave remote sensing is the X band in uh, three centimeter, C band in 5.6 centimeter, and L band in 23 centimeters. There are also shorter bands, less than three and uh, one centimeter, that uh, uses for military purposes. Okay. Uh, in this slide, I will talk about uh, slightly about the. Uh, microwave remote sensing geometry because it is a little bit different from optical remote sensing because optical remote sensing measure the uh, pictures or taking the pictures or image for air surface at the nadir point as we see in the slide nadir point is a vertical point beneath the satellite but in the case of the microwave remote sensing the signal is transmitted in oblique direction it is not directly not with the vertical angle it is with angle uh, known as a look angle theta and incidence angle so there is a little bit viewing geometry different viewing geometry for microwave remote sensing the flight path that the satellite is uh, orbiting to it is known as azimuth direction direction and the cross direction to the azimuth direction is known as range direction and this distance of the on the on the air surface that has been imaged 
is known as S1. So we have two different uh, naming here. It is azimuth direction and range direction, and also the distance between the satellite and the Earth's targets or Earth's surface is known as slant range distance. Also, one of the main difference between uh, microwave and uh, optical remote sensing is that the pixel size or the resolution, it is not always square, like in uh, optical remote sensing, Landsat or Sentinel-2. Uh, azimuth direction, uh, there is two measurements for the resolution. It is the azimuth resolution and range resolution. And in most cases, to achieve a better resolution, they will not be square until we do a process called the multi-looking. So the transmitted microwave energy travels through atmosphere because the satellite is out of space. And traveling through atmosphere will make some delays, like we will discuss uh, in a moment. After uh, the transmitting through the atmosphere, the microwave energy interacts with ground targets, and these interactions have three forms, transmission, absorption, or scattering. Uh, for this webinar, we will be only focusing on scattering processing process, and this process depends on, on the operating wavelengths and the target characteristics. Target characteristics such as the, it is, uh, it is the measurement of the uh, surface roughness for the for each uh, target. Like if it, if the surface is rough, then the amount of energy that back is scattered to the sensor will be larger than smooth uh, smoother uh, surface. So this uh, processing of scattering it depends on uh, the operating wavelengths and the level of the roughness that the surface has. Because for uh, longer wavelengths, even rough surface can be appear very smooth. And in this case, it will be dark. The smooth surface will be uh, in the image will uh, show as a dark object, while the rough surface will appear in a bright object. SAR image pixel. The pixel of the SAR image contains information about the backscattered energy. As we discussed, that the signal or uh, microwave energy travels through the atmosphere, then interacts with the target, then backscattered back, uh, to the sensor again. This information composed of amplitude and phase. Amplitude measures the scattering characteristics of the target, like the roughness or the physical uh, component of, uh, properties of the target, while phase measure the distance between satellite, sensor, and target. And this is, will be our focus for this webinar. We'll focus mainly on the phase value because we're interested in the distance between satellite and targets. Radar sensor records the phase shift between transmitted and received phase. So the wind the phase when the signal is transmitted from the sensor, but uh, the phase at that point is recorded, then the shift between the phase of the transmitted and received is known, and this is phase is related to the distance. Because the change between it, the different distance between two different targets will have two different phase value because they will have two different range distance. Okay, to explain this more, if we have an amplitude of this value, like I said, we are not interested in the amplitude, but we have a phi, phase of value of phi, then the distance for this, uh, the distance for this target could lie in any of these locations. Actually, we don't know the exact location, but we know if either of these locations could be after one cycle could be after two cycles of wavelengths, four cycles. The, no, the real number, it is unknown, but we know it is one of these locations. As we can see for different targets, we will have different distance. Unless these two tar these different targets 
have a distance that increasing by two by or by half of the wavelength. And this is the problem of the phase in the microwave uh, remote sensing known as the wrapped phase. Wrapped phase meaning that it is wrapping around itself. It is repeating the same measurement. And why this is happening? Because the phase when it, is, it increased from zero to two by, and whenever it reach two by, the next pixel will start from zero, then increase again to two by, then drop to zero, and uh, repeating the same cycle. So it's called wrap phase. Uh, this is what the main information about uh, microwave remote sensing that we need for star interferometry. So what is star interferometry? And uh, it's also called INSAR as a abbreviation for interferometry. It is combining the phase of two or more star complex image because like we said in the previous uh, slide that one uh, phase value is useless because when if I have uh, two different targets, but their distance increasing by two by, they will appear in the image at the same distance. So this is not useful. But combining two SAR images together and comparing their phase values will give so much information and so useful information. But these two uh, uh, complex image or SAR images should be acquired from different positions or different times. Different position here, we mean uh, it should be from different position in the space, in the uh, space in the orbit, for the orbit that satellite is uh, orbiting around the Earth. Or it, it could be from the same position in the orbit, but at different time. So as uh, we, uh, we we talked in the previous slide that the phase contains information about the range distance, and this information is in a fraction of the wavelength. So we don't know it if uh, it is uh, the precision of the information is less than uh, one cycle of the wavelength. So, uh, like uh, if we are using uh, X band which uses a three centimeter wavelength. Uh, this means the precision of the distance, it is less than three centimeter. And it depends on other factors. So range distance differences, so the difference between the two images and or two uh, positions can be detected in millimeter resolution. Since I know one distance, in less than three centimeter, maybe in less than one centimeter, so I can measure the difference in millimetric resolution. And this uh, measurements or detection, this value, it is independent of the SAR dis uh, target distance. It doesn't matter how the how the how much the elevation or altitude of the satellite. So this is can work for airplane. Uh, interferometry or satellite interferometry. But we still have the main drawback for this uh, technique or technology that uh, the major phase difference is ambiguous within the wavelengths. Like, and as I said, the problem of the wrapped phase. Uh, let's assume this is the geometry for the INSAR. We have two satellites separated in a distance in space and measuring the same target. The distance between uh, two satellites in space is known as uh, baseline. And the distance between each satellite and the target is known as uh, slant range distance. And this is the look angle, theta. And uh, small h, it is uh, ground elevation of the target and capital H is a uh, uh, satellite altitude. Also, we have an important, uh, an important distance, which is a perpendicular baseline, it is a perpendicular distance between the satellite and the slant range for the other satellite. We can measure the phase using this uh, equation. It is a uh, two by over wavelengths multiplied by the distance, and this is the 
equation that used to measure the distance in sinusoidal function, which it is, it is used to uh, express, uh, express the microwave signal to satellite. It is two by over wavelength multiplied by the distance, and the distance it is two by two R, sorry, because that signal as uh, discussed, it is going and back. It is transmitting and receiving. So it is two by over lambda multiplied by two R. So it is, will become four by over lambda multiplied by R. Uh, for measuring the phase difference between this, this equation will be applied for each phase information that collected at each satellite. We'll have the phase difference only changing the distance between for the slant range. The, uh, the difference in the slant range is related directly to the phase difference for each satellite. And this distance <coughs> can be expressed as this one. Mathematically, it is not exactly the same distance, but because these distances are very high related to the uh, baseline. Slant range distance, it is very high compared to the baseline. This could be in meters, and this will be for several kilometers. So we can assume that delta R, it is the same, this separated distance. And the image that we form to uh, calculate this uh, phase difference between the two images, it's known as interferogram. And this interferogram is formed by a process called uh, complex product for two image, two SAR images. Finally, using uh, trigonometry, we can measure, we can change the delta R, the change in the slant range distances into uh, more system information because the distance to the slant range will change uh, from target to target. So to avoid this changing, it is better to use the lock angle and the baseline because it is more static information. Okay, uh, now I will talk about the uh, types of INSAR. We have, uh, like I said in this uh, slide, that it should be separated in space or in time. So it is either it will be in one pass or repeat pass. So in one pass, it could be cross track, cross track as uh, when I de uh, described the uh, microwave remote sensing. I said that the cross track, it is the direction crossing the uh, flight path like this one. So the flight path in this case, it is uh, pointing out of the screen. So these two separated in uh, cross track direction and it is in one single pass or it can be repeat pass, but also cross in uh, the distance separated is uh, in the cross direction. The other type is uh, a long track, which uh, the two antennas or two sensors will be separated uh, in the along track direction. It is the flight path direction of the satellite. Or it can be from repeat pass and the two satellites will be separated in, uh, in time or in a long track. These, uh, these combinations will give us four types of uh, interferometry. It is either cross track in single pass or repeat pass, or in a long track, uh, long track in a single pass or repeat pass. But in practical, we, we interested in two types of these four. The first is cross track in uh, <coughs> a single pass or a long track in a repeat pass. And we'll talk in, uh, we will talk about these two cases. Cross track in SAR. Uh, since SAR images are projected from 3D to do 2D, like any uh, SAR information or any satellite uh, image, it means they do not contain information about the height. Because if we have the information about the height, then it will be 3D image, it will not be 2D. So the single pass cross track in SAR, it resolves the height with high precision. And the main application of this technique or this type of INSAR is creating the digital elevation model, such as 
the SRTM mission, which use the cross track uh, platform in single pass, but it, uh, it doesn't necessary to be at the same platform. They could be two satellites orbiting at the same time with the with known baseline. So this is can be used to measure the uh, elevation in very precise. Uh, manner and this is the case of the tandem X. If you heard of it, uh, it is calculated using this technique: two satellites orbiting at the same time with known baseline. Okay, this phase it is known as we as uh, we talked about. It is related to the topography or the elevation. It is not as uh, topographic phase. So from uh, the trigonometry of uh, this geometry, we can calculate that uh, the elevation, ground elevation, is equal to uh, satellite altitude minus r cosine theta. And this value can be, uh, this equation can be derived using differentiation to calculate how much the <coughs> change in the phase is related to change in the elevation. Uh, I don't want you to focus so much on the how we derive the equation. Just it is because it is very simple uh, differentiation. But knowing this information is very critical because if I know the how much the change between two adjacent pixels, with this change, how much the elevation will change? How the face is sensitive with changing elevation? This. If I know this information and already know how to calculate the change between adjacent pixel facing adjacent pixels, then I can only just uh, transform the phase information or phase difference information into elevations, and this is can be done using this uh, the known as integration factor that used to to convert between phase information into height elevations. So this is, they are calculating this information. It is critical for finding the digital elevation model. Then uh, after uh, calculating the phase difference between each pixels, each two pixels, then we can use this information to convert the phase information into elevation. Now we'll go to the along track. In SAR, uh, theoretically, that repeat pass along track in SAR should have zero baseline between the acquisitions because all, if we are uh, taking image for the same spot and it is traveling back again, it will, uh, in, in, when it will uh, repeat the cycle around the earth and come back to, to the same spot, it will measure the, take another image if it, uh, if it was in the same place, it will have zero baseline. If it has zero baseline, this means that there is no sensitive to elevation because the look angle didn't change. If we go back to the uh, information that the delta phi is only related to the distance between a satellite at the first case and the second case, it is only related to the delta r. If there is no change in delta r, this means there is no change in phi, then delta phi will be zero. Unless there is a displacement. If the same target moved uh, like a small distance away, then the range distance will be changed, then we will have phi delta phi information. So this we call it displacement. If we have zero baseline and we have displacement, in this case, delta phi will be related only to the target displacement. But in practice, there is always baseline. Uh, the same satellite, it never come to this, never come back to the same place. So there is always a baseline between the first acquisition and the second acquisition. So in this case, the delta phi will be related to both height and displacement. So we need to make the height, uh, the topographic phase, and remove it if we are interested in the displacement. Uh, the purpose of this type is to measure surface displacement. 
this is uh, can, uh, removing, estimating and removing the topographic base is known as uh, differential insert or differential interferogram. And there is two ways to do that. The first, by uh, using three SAR image, utilizing the first two to uh, measuring the interferogram. And uh, second and third to measure the topographic phase. Then subtract the topographic phase from interferogram. And then we have differential interferogram where it is phase only related to the displacement. <clears throat> the second way is uh, using two SAR image with digital elevation model. In this type, we are not interested in uh, measuring digital or generating digital elevation model. We are interested in the target displacement or target movement. So we will use external them to calculate the topographic phase and the two SAR image to generate the interferogram, then subtract the topographic phase from the interferogram to generate the differential interferogram. So the phase of the differential in SAR or D in SAR will be the same equation, but in this case, delta R is not related to the topography, it is related to the displacement of the target. And same as uh, the measurement of the digital elevation model, the accuracy of differential insert, extraction of the wavelength, and, but also it depends on the accuracy of the dim. So it, they both need to be in centimeter or millimeter resolution. Uh, so the measurement of the displacement will be uh, very small or very high. Uh, what I mean about the accuracy of the dim, it is not the spatial resolution. I mean the accuracy of measuring the elevation itself, the value of the pixel should be in very, it should be very high sensitive. Okay, what, is the, the, what are the drawbacks for this uh, differential in SAR technique? It is that the, the target could physically change between acquisition, like uh, in construction sites. If uh, the first acquisition, we have a small amount or small number of buildings, and then the building become taller, become the added some uh, materials, it changed. So at the second time, this is will change everything for the signal. We will have different signals. So recognizing that it is the same target will be very hard. As another example for physical or, uh, or change in general for the surface will be in vegetation cover. So as we all know that vegetation uh, grows uh, seasonally, so from the first day to the second day to the third day, that there is a change in the phenological cycle that will make that will make change in the signal response or in the backscatter uh, signal. So this will make a loss in coherence and make the measuring of the differential are more complicated. And also there is a variation in the atmosphere, the uh, constituents of the atmosphere change during the day. So that uh, means from day to another day that will be changed. And this will cause a, a different atmospheric delays to make the path for the target go unpacked will be different. Maybe the target in the same place, but due to the change of the atmospheric constituents, the signal uh, took a longer path. So that the information we have will uh, we will contain some noise. Now, we, uh, the next uh, step, we'll talk about how we can deal with this type of uh, noise. So, as I said, there is a uh, multiple uh, contributors to the interferometric phase. When I have two images and only create the interferogram and subtract the phase, I not only have the topography phase or displacement phase, I have uh, I, yes, I, this is the most important tool that uh, the technique of the interferometry made for, but there is a flat earth phase. This phase is uh, uh, generated due to the changing in the look angle. Like I said, it is a oblique system that the signal is transmitted in uh, oblique direction. So, uh, in the range direction that cross uh, the flat flight path, 
there is a near field and far field. Near field is the point nearest the satellite you are in the SWAT, and the far field is the point away from the satellite. And the incidence angle or look angle is changing through the SWAT or through the range direction. So this changing will generate a phase because the phase, the angle is changing and the distance is changing. So the phase will change even there is no displacement or there is no uh, elevation. Even if the elevation is, is zero, you will see there is a different uh, differentiation in the phase. So this is so easy. We can uh, using the flat earth approximation, we can calculate the phase that generated from this uh, look angle and subtract this phase. Uh, the second one, or the fourth one, is a phase that related to the atmosphere uh, that I discussed in the previous uh, slide, that the uh, atmosphere constituents can uh, make the travel path longer than uh, it has to be. And there is a noise that related to the target itself or related to the sensor. So we need to estimate and remove other components, either if we are interested in topography or interested in displacement. If we are interested in topography, it is better to use a single pass <coughs> because uh, in single pass, definitely there is no displacement because the two image has been acquired at the same time. So in this case, we will not have to deal with this one. We have to remove the other. Uh, in the repeat pass, definitely we will have topography phase. So we need to estimate it and remove it, and also estimate the other uh, components and remove them. After remove uh, these three, the last three one, we'll have this equation that uh, the topography and the displacement, topography can be, if we have the digital elevation model, then we already know H or delta H here. So we can calculate the, uh, the phase that related to the topography. Then we have only the phase that related to the displacement. Okay, we talk about all of these components, the noise, how we can reduce the noise. Uh, the development of the inside, it, it is based on not may, uh, calculating or processing every pixel on the image. It is by selecting the pixels that has low result, uh, low noise, low face noise. And and through a lot of years of studying and researching, they found that the most pixels have low noise that can be classified in two types of pixels or two types of scatterers. The first is called the resistance scatterers, which is related to pixels with one dominant scatterer, and it is because scattering is consistent through time. As we see in the image, we have a smaller scatterer within the pixel, but there is one strong than others, and it is consistent through time. And this is very important to be consistent through time. The other uh, type is known as distributed scatterer. And we have uh, a smaller uh, scatter, scatterer within a pixel, but their uh, resultant or product for this pixel is consistent through time. It is not strong, it is not high, but it is consistent and it can be measured through time consistently. So this is why it is very important to use this type. This, this could be valuable for uh, vegetation cover. So doing pro, uh, processing the INSAR uh, analysis, uh, use over only, do, only this type of uh, pixels or scatterers, we reduce this value of uh, face noise. And we have, uh, and these, are, these two are related to main type of uh, coherent targets. The first is uh, like uh, cities where building and bridges are dominant and streets and also rock surfaces is very hard, very solid and their uh, uh, response to the radar it is very coherent and consistent through time. The low coherent targets, like uh, I said, like vegetation cover and also sand cover. Sand also uh, uh, classified as low coherent target. So here 
uh, I will be back to the wrapped face problem. So as I said, if I measure the phase difference or the differential phase, that is, uh, it is related to the uh, target displacement. And this displacement has X value in the phase. So if I measure this X value, it could be like this one. This is the location within the sinusoidal function before I transform it to the to, to real difference. So what if I have another target that the displacement between the two images or the two dates was X plus two Y. So it will have one round and will it come to the same place. But this one, it is in different place in the sinusoidal function. And also it can go back if uh, it was X plus four by. It will go to the second one. These four, uh, all these three values are in different places in our different uh, displacements in the reality in ground and in the sinusoidal function. But within the image, all of them will look the same, will give me the same value of the uh, displacement, which it is not true. And this is the problem of using the face, the wrapped face. So here comes the most important and most complicated step in the SAR processing. It's called the face unwrapping. It is resolving the real number of the face cycles. It's converting this repetitive measurement, like the face it is going, uh, increasing from zero to two by, then the next value, it will not two by plus uh, X, it will be zero. And then it's going again and, and again, it is uh, dropping to zero. There is algorithm and it's still developing that how we can make the face look like this. If it exists, the problem solved, but it is not highly accurate yet. But this is the most important step in the uh, uh, analysis, I'm um, analyzing the insert. It's called the face camera. <coughs> also, to measure the displacement, it, uh, usually we don't measure the displacement for only two dates. We use time series techniques. It is, and um, also this is the one of the most known techniques to resolve this problem or make the face unwrapping more easy is by using a time series of uh, time series of data set. And uh, the, day, the time series or the data set should be uh, continuously without any gaps and should be minimum content of 30 images, maybe more in some study, you, we can use more than 100, more than 200 uh, images. The most known in SAR techniques, I will give some uh, brief uh, information about this one. It is uh, the resistance scatterer interferometry, DSI, small baseline subset, SPAS, Stanford method for uh, the resistance scatterer stamps. And the criteria that used for uh, developing these uh, techniques, baseline configuration, pixel selection, and deformation moment. In this table, there is a summary for uh, each uh, for uh, comparison between them that the PSI using single master, only one image to register or uh, calculate the displacement uh, to, while SPAS use uh, grouping the data in multiple uh, small baselines, then try to connecting all these clusters together. And stamps use the single master configuration. Uh, the Techniques that use for pixel selection in BSI, uh, there is um, it is called amplitude amplitude uh, amplitude uh, dispersion, uh, which is uh, actually is a measure of the covariation coefficient for the amplitude value, the, by dividing the mean over the standard deviation, while the second one using the coherence uh, equation and the stamps use uh, amplitude and phase criteria. This is why stamps uh, uh, recognize as the most used uh, inside techniques because they use phase criteria, not only the coherence or the amplitude. 
this uh, the scatterer type used here uh, in uh, PSI and stamps are uh, the resistant scatterer, and uh, small baseline uses the therapeutic scatterer. The PSI using assumption about linear deformation in time, while the SPS and stamps use spatial smoothness for the uh, for the phenomena. This assumption helps in uh, resolving the face unwrapping process, but actually in some uh, phenomena it can it can be reliant because linear deformation time that means the deformation is consistent it's going like a two millimeter barrier and it is constant like that it is not changing and in uh, in real life this is not this is, could not be the case especially uh, special smoothness that uh, this means that the uh, displacement it is uh, smooth uh, during the space there is no abrupt change and this is in the, in the case of the earthquakes and uh, slide slide this can be true because we can have uh, an abrupt uh, subsidence or abrupt, abrupt up, uh, uplift so but these assumptions are important for the face unwrapping okay uh, i don't know how much time that i have but i will talk uh, I will give a, a quick information about the case study that uh, I did during my uh, PhD. I did a study about the land subsidence in Rimah area. I assume that most of you all know the location, know the land cover. It is most uh, there is small uh, buildings there, and uh, uh, it known for it is known for uh, agricultural activities. And the main reason that uh, I I, use, I did the study there that that I know about the farming activities in the in the area, and all of these farming farms are uh, relying on groundwater resources. So the uh, reports that published by the environmental agency uh, of Abu Dhabi that the ground the annual ground discharge at this area it is about two hundred and forty four million cubic meter, and this results in a huge. Uh, Draw down in just six years, like from five to 15 meters. So when I uh, was doing the work on the groundwater, because I'm a geologist, so I know there is something wrong in this area uh, because this uh, depression cone, it is formed like uh, years, years ago. So the data in 2013 and 2019, just showing that the depression cone is already formed years ago and it is developing. It is going really extent and extending at the areas with no uh, uh, farms. Uh, there, there is no farming activity in this area in some areas and there is no wells pumping the data, pumping the groundwater. But because the pumping in this area is very high, this result in uh, extensive and spreading uh cone, depression cone so this is why i conducted the study so i thought that this is will be useful and uh, definitely the groundwater will affect the surface i used sentinel one that operates in c-band with 12 day revisit period i used 37 uh, images collected between 2015 and 2019 february 2015 and may 2019 and uh, this image acquired on October 22nd, 2017, was the master image. I measured the deformation from uh, each image to this image, and then generated the whole uh, displacement. And I used uh, STAMS technique. Uh, this is was the pilot study for me for the BHD to study all the land subsidence or land deformations in the UAE. And actually, I found uh, a significant result that uh, this farming causing the land subsidence for more than 40 millimeter per year and this is and this study is just for four years and in the middle of the deformation and the deformation it is, it is, is still going so studying period before this one uh, is important so to know when the, the deformation starts and how we can deal with it I'm just showing, showing this to show the importance of the INSAR and how valuable information 
can we get from uh, interferometry? So this is uh, the main result that there is a deformation that uh, there is places uh, more than uh, 40 millimeter per year and others in the range between 30 to 20 or 15, but it is still a huge amount of deformation or subsequent happen due to groundwater uh, exploitation. So I related the water level drawdown with the displacement uh, over some well. There is one well showing this deformation, like 15 meter at this deformation, uh, a drawdown in the, the in the blue showing that the groundwater level is uh, decreasing in few, uh, for the four years in 15 meters, but the displacement is going higher. It is uh, in, uh, it is more than uh, 40 millimeter. It is start to be going down, down, down. It now it is reach 40 millimeter and more, and it's going towards 60. 60. And as I said, this study was on uh, in 20 stop in 2019. This means three, three years ago. Now it is the deformation will be more than 60 millimeter per year. For a conclusion, uh, SAR interferometry is an invaluable tool for monitoring land surface deformation. It is the most reliable tool. There is other tools in uh, in history and literature. You can find other tools like GPS, like uh, leveling, survey leveling, but uh, they are not efficient as uh, in SAR. They, these techniques will take uh, more effort, more time, uh, more cost. So. It is not comparable to uh, INSAR. This, this, those techniques can be used with INSAR to achieve higher resolution than INSAR. And also can be used for ground uh, elevation. So uh, since I talked about the cost, uh, there, uh, there are many three radar missions, not a small amount. And most of the interferometry processing uh, Open sources are free. There is some with cost, but most of them are free. So monthly updated maps for land surface deformation can be achieved for any given area. Studying the land, uh, generating the digital elevation model can be convenient for one, uh, one a year or two, uh, two times in a year. But land surface deformation, because it is a continuing process. So studying this using, uh, doing an updated map monthly it is achievable because we have so many open sources and so many free radar missions and uh, that's it for the presentation thank you for your listening and it's time for your questions <laughs>